In kinetics, there's an important concept called half-life. Half-life is defined as the time to consume the reactants to half of its initial concentration. Now, let's plot the, re the reactant concentration change with time. So this is the concentration and this is the time for the reactants. So initially, it's here. That's the initial concentration. Right now, with time, we know the reactants will decrease. Right. OK, so half of the concentration is here. And the time here, this time is called half-life because this is the time to consume the initial concentration to become half of its initial value. Now it turns out that for first order reaction, half-life have an equation like this, ln2 divided by k. Notice that this equation does not have concentration, means that half-life does not depend on concentration, in initial concentration. Now, ln2 is also 0 0.693, so half-life is also 0 0.693 divided by k. Half-life can be easily measured by experiments, and therefore k can be calculated. So whenever you have half-life, you know the rate constant. But remember, this is only for first-order reaction. If it's zero-order or second-order reactions, the half-life do depends on the concentration. And we introduce other equations to calculate half-life for uh, the second order reaction. Okay, so her first order reaction, the half-life is a constant. Okay, radioactive decay is one example of first order reaction. The half-life for a radio radioactive nucleus is a very useful indicator of its stable stability. For example, if in a, a element, a radioactive decay half-life is very long, for example, uh, 10 million years, that means it takes a very, very long time to consume half, half of it. And that indicates this is a stable element. The nucleus is stable. On the other hand, if another element uh, decays uh, have a half-life only 10 seconds, that means it consumes half of it in 10 seconds. And that, that tells you this element is very unstable. Here is a plot of the concentration N2O5 as a function of time. Initially, you start from 0 0.06. With time, the concentration decrease goes to 0 0.05, 0 0.04, all right? So concentration decrease with time. Now, where is the half of the initial concentration? This is initial concentration. Half of it should be 0 0.03, and this is the half of the initial concentration. So how much time to take to go to half of it? And that's the time, all right? Time is 24. So the half-life for this reaction is 24 minutes. Now this half-life is measured starting from this 0 0.06 as the initial concentration. What if we start from another point such as 0 0.03 as the initial concentration? So now this becomes initial concentration. All right, so what is the half of it? It should be here, 0 .0, 0 0.015. And this is the half of the initial concentration. So that the point is here. So the time to go from 0 0.06, uh, 0 0.03 to 0. 0.015 is all right that is 48 minus 24 
all right so 48 minus 24 because you start from 24 minute and you go to 48 minute so that's again give you 24 minute all right so you see the the half-life all right give you uh, give you the same half-life no matter where you start with you start with 0 0.06 or 0 0.03 uh, concentration the half-life is the same half-life does not depends on the initial concentration and that's indication this is the first order reaction okay another thing we uh, we can see here is that if this is the initial concentration 0 0.06 after one half life this is one half life the concentration becomes half of it right that's the uh, become 0 0.03 if you uh, go to another half life okay then the concentration becomes half of this one so half of this one so that's uh, uh, you can write as 2 to the second power of the initial concentration if you do another half-life then this will becomes half of this one and this is uh, uh, 2 squared a naught divided by 2 squared that's the that's this one that's the initial concentration and you half of this one so 3 half-life after 3 uh, half life then the concentration becomes uh, 2 second power a naught times half that will give you 2 third power a naught okay so the power is actually uh, the number of half life one half life uh, give you so here this is one half life so half a naught see the power is one one half life the concentration becomes a naught divided by two after two half life and the concentration becomes a naught divided by two to the second power and the third after third uh, half life the concentration becomes a naught divided by two to the third power Sample problem 16.6. .6. In this question, uh, the reaction start from uh, A, which is green uh, molecules, and it forms uh, blue uh, as B and yellow as C. And there's still some A uh, not reacted. So the question, first question is, draw a similar molecular scene of the reaction mixture at 60 seconds so look at the diagram the first diagram is zero seconds that means it's starting point and then 30 seconds so this is 30 seconds it asks you to to draw a similar thing at 60 seconds so again this is the drawing uh, initially you have eight a molecules and after 30 seconds, you have four uh, blue ones and four yellow ones for C, all right? You also have four A left, okay? Because four uh, is half of eight, and that tells you 30 seconds is the half life, all right? Because it consumes half of the reactants, so that's the half life. Also notice that um, when you consume 4A, okay, 8 becomes 4. So it consumes 4A, it forms 4B, 4C. That means every A forms 1B plus 1C. Okay, the re that's the balanced reaction. Okay, initially you have eight molecules, A, no B, no C. After 30 seconds, all right, 30 seconds, uh, you have how many A's? You have 4A left. You have 4B, 4C. Okay, that, that means you reacted 4. Okay, so now what about the 60 seconds? So 60 seconds is, so 30 seconds is half life. 60 seconds is another half life. 
So the four should become two, all right? Consumes two. So how much reacted? The reacted must be two. R means reacted, must be two. Because you start with four, you end up with four, two. So reacted is two. According to this equation, whenever you consume two, this also forms two, forms two. And therefore, after 60 seconds, this add together should be six, six. All right. So if you draw the diagram, you should have two uh, green ones because that's a reactance, two green ones, and the six yellow, and the six uh, blue. Okay, so that's the answer for this question. In question B, it asks you, uh, find the rate constant, K, okay, for the reaction. Now we already know 30 seconds is the half-life because you have 8A and you now here you only have 4A left and half of it. So that's half-life. According to the first order reaction, the half-life is net natural log 2 divided by K. And so the half-life is 30 seconds and therefore K can be calculated. So here is the equation. All right. So half-life is 0 0.693, that's the ln2, divided by k. So k is 0 0.693 divided by half-life, which is 30 seconds, and the answer is uh, 2.31 times 10 to the minus 2 per second. Uh, again, whenever you have half-life, you uh, whenever you can measure half-life, you can calculate the k constant for first order reaction. All right, in C, uh, if the total pressure in a mixture, in the mixture is 5, at 90 seconds, what is the partial pressure of the substance B? Okay. Note that um, 30 seconds is the half-life, 60 seconds is the second half-life, and therefore 90 seconds is the three half-life. So after three half-life, we, we want to calculate the partial pressure. So let's write the reaction. A forms B plus C. All right. So initially you have eight. All right. So zero B, zero C. 30 seconds, that's half life. Eight becomes four. And four A becomes four B, four C. After 60 seconds, that's another half life. So four becomes two. And the two molecules goes to B, two B. So four plus two is six. Uh, 4 plus 2 is 6, 6 C. Now, 90 seconds, then 2 becomes 1, another half-life, so 2 becomes 1. So the one molecule A is consumed to form B. So 6 plus 1 is 7, and 6 plus 1 is 7. So you have 1 A in the mixture, 7 B in the mixture, and 7 C in the mixture. Now, to calculate the partial pressure, we should use the equation partial pressure of B equals the more fraction of B. More fraction is the ratio of, sorry, is B. More fraction of B is the ratio of number of moles B to the total number of moles. It's like a percent of B in the mixture. And then you times the total pressure. Oh, sorry, total, total pressure. Now total pressure is five, okay? So you need to calculate the mole fraction. And how do you calculate the mole fraction? It's the number of moles, so here is number of moles B is seven divided by total number of moles, one plus seven plus seven. And that gives you the mole fraction. It also tells you the percent of B in the mixture. And then you times total pressure. Okay, so 0 0.4767 times 5, and the answer is 2.33 atmosphere. Sample problem 16.7. This question is about first order reaction half-life. 
So we have a cyclopropane, it's this molecule. At high temperature, uh, this molecule will isomize to another molecule called propene. So you can write as A as a reactant, B as a product. And this reaction is a first order reaction. The rate constant K is given to be 9.2 per second. The question is, what is the half-life? To solve the half-life, uh, we have an equation for first order reaction, and that is ln2 divided by k. And plug in k and ln2, uh, so ln2 is 0 0.693, and k is 9.2 per second, and so you can solve the half-life. All right. So whenever you have a rate constant, uh, you can calculate the half-life like this. Or if you have half-life, you can calculate the rate constant. Okay, so in, in, remember first order reaction, this is the equation, All right? Next question is to find the time to reach one quarter of the initial concentration. Now, we already uh, seen some uh, sample question that whenever it's about the time and the concentration change, we have an integral rate law. So for first order reaction, integral rate law says the natural log initial concentration divided by the concentration of at a certain time equals k times the time. And so here is the time, here is the concentration. All right, so if, if this becomes one quarter, that means uh, initial concentration divided by four, all right, then the left side will be ln uh, one divided by one over four, which is ln four. So left side becomes ln4, the right side becomes uh, kt. And therefore you can solve t by ln4 divided by k. k is given, so you can calculate time. All right, if you are interested, please try it and see what the uh, time uh, calculated by this equation. Now, but sometimes there's an easier way. So here we're going to think about whether we can use half-life to calculate the time. Because okay, the half-life is 0 0.075 seconds uh, uh, to go from uh, initial concentration to a half of it. That's a half-life. And if you do another half-life, then it becomes half of this one. So that will be one quarter of it. So that tells you, uh, you do two half-lives and the initial concentration be becomes one quarter. And that is easier. So two times the half-life, 0 0.075 times two. Okay, and that is 0 0.15. So in this case, uh, it's easier to use half-life. Uh, so you, you do two, two uh, times half-life and that gives you one quarter of the initial concentration. But remember, in general, whenever you, you want to find time concentration, all right, for a certain concentration, think about integrated rate law. We have seen the first order reaction half-life, which is ln2 divided by k. And ln2 is 0 0.693, so divided by k. That's the half-life for the first order reaction. What about the second order reaction? Second order reaction half-life is one divided by k divided by a naught. Okay, so note, note the difference. Here, you have a concentration, all right? So half-life depends on the initial concentration. Well, first order reaction does not have initial concentration. And the zero order reaction also have the in initial concentration divided by 2k. Okay, so both second order, zero order, the half life depends on initial concentration, but the first order reaction is independent of initial concentration. So let's imagine you start with one molarity as initial concentration. You measure the half life, let's say 10 hours, 
If it's first order reaction, you change if you measure at another concentration, let's say two molarity, and the half-life is still 10 hours. It doesn't change. But for second order reaction, one molarity if the half-life is 10 hours, and if you becomes two molarity and measure half-life. And according to this equation, if you increase the concentration, the half-life decrease. So it's be it becomes five hours. Instead of 10 hours, it's five hours because the concentration becomes more concentrated. Reaction go faster, and so it takes less time. That's about the second order reaction. Okay, second order reaction is more sensitive to the concentration. Now, if it's zero order reaction, one molarity, when you measure half-life, it's 10 hours. If you increase to two molarity, if you measure half-life according to this equation, it actually uh, half-life increase linearly with the concentration. So it becomes 20 hours according to this equation. Okay, so, uh, so you see half-life uh, is different from first order, second order, zero order. You must choose the correct equation. And the important thing is half-life independent of concentration for the first order reaction, but do cha does change with the concentration for the second order and the zero order. Here is a summary of uh, zero order, first order, second order reaction. So rate law, a uh, first order reaction is a Ka first power, second order is uh, Ka squared, and the zero order should be Ka0. And uh, anything to the zero power is one, so it's just K. All right, so that's the rate law. And these are the units, all right? And half-life, we just show that for the first order reaction is ln2 divided by K. Okay, uh, so ln2 divided by K. For second order reaction is one divided by K divided by A naught. Sorry, uh, it doesn't come out right, but you can look at the uh, previous slides. And for half uh, half life, for the zero order reaction is uh, A naught divided by two K. Okay, so that's half life. Choose the correct equation for different uh, order reactions. <clears throat> now, integral rate law, for the first order reaction, we show that it's ln A divided by A naught equals negative KT. That's one way to write it, all right? If you uh, modify this equation, you can also write like this. It's the ln A equals negative KT plus ln A naught, okay? So the good thing to write like this shows this is a linear equation, y equals kx plus b. So y is ln a. And so if you plot ln a as a function of time, then you get a linear equation. And the slope is negative k. OK, it's negative k here. So ln k a over time is a linear. That's for the first order reaction. Now, second order reaction, uh, integral rate law is 1 over a, all right, uh, minus 1 over a naught equals kt. Okay, that's one way to write uh, second order reaction. Again, these equations already uh, uh, showed uh, in uh, previous slides. You can go back and find these integral rate laws. Now, this equation, if you modify it, you get uh, this form, and uh, they are equivalent. And this says a, 1 over a naught or a equals kt plus 1 over a naught. So again, this uh, is a linear equation, y equals kx. y is inverse concentration, and the time is x. And this 1 over a naught is a b, so k, uh, kx plus b. So if you plot is inverse concentration, over time, you get a straight line and the slope is k. Okay? So first order reaction is the natural log 
over T is straight line. Second order reaction is inverse concentration over time is a straight line. Zero order reaction is linear. Okay, concentration equals negative KT. It's not a nat natural log. It's not inverse. It's concentration itself are proportional to the time. So you plot concentration and the time. You get a straight line and the slope is negative K. Okay, so that's the summary. Uh, first order, zero order, and the second order reaction. And you can see uh, you can uh, uh, see which order uh, reaction is just by looking at the half life, whether it depends on concentration or not, or by plot. Okay, so if it's linear, uh, if uh, natural log concentration over time linear, that's first order reaction. If inverse concentration time is linear, that's second order reaction. If concentration itself with time is linear, that's a zero order reaction. One of the theories in uh, the uh, kinetics is called the uh, collision theory, uh, which says particles must collide in order to react. So these are the reactants and they collide and then forms product. By collision, molecules gain energy. So they have enough energy to overcome energy barrier becomes product. So imagine you have a lot of molecules. All right, these are all the reactants. So many reactants. Then you have a lot of chances for the molecules to collide. The more molecules you have, the more probability, all right, the molecules can collide. And that give a higher reaction rate, increased reaction rate. So that explains why reaction rate law is proportional to the concentration, to the nth power. Because the more concentrate, the more molecules you have, the more collisions they make, and the faster the reaction goes. Here is a, another drawing of the number of molecules and the collision. So if you have, uh, this reaction is between A and B. So the A and the B must collide. So you have two A, two B, then this uh, first A collide with first B, or first A collide with second B, uh, second A collide with first B, second A collide with second B. So you have four possible collisions. Now if you add one more A, so 3A, still 2B, then the collision becomes six. Okay, this is one, this is two, all right, this is three, four, five, six. So you have six possibilities for A and B collide, all right? If you increase uh, one more B, then you have nine collisions, you can look at it. So the more molecules you have, the more collisions you have, and therefore the faster the reaction rate. So far, we show that reaction rate is affected by the concentration, the rate constant times concentration to a certain power, all right? So we show the first order reaction, second order reaction, zero order reaction. They all shows how the reaction rate change with concentration. But we thought, we also know that the, the reaction rate is affected by temperature. Uh, experimental shows that whenever you increase temperature 10 degree, the reaction rate double or triple the reaction rate. So in this equation, Okay, where is the temperature? How does temperature affect the reaction rate? It turns out that it's this rate constant that affected by temperature. So if you change temperature, this will change. If you increase temperature, the rate constant change, and that will increase the reaction rate. Okay, the equation is called Arrhenius equation. Arrhenius equation says, shows how this rate constant change with temperature. So you can write as 
a constant times e to the negative e a over r t and this is called the uh, Uranus equation this rate constant is this one all right and this is a constant called the frequency factor okay frequency factor uh, is related to how how many collisions you have the more collisions and uh, the more the higher this uh, frequency factor <clears throat> Here is the temperature, R is the uh, gas constant, all right, you have studied the uh, gas law, so that's a gas constant, okay. And uh, this Ea is a very important parameter, it's called activation energy. So activation energy uh, is the energy barrier, so uh, before um, the pr reactants forms product, so the theory says the reactant if this is a reactant this energy this is a product so reactants product that's the this is the energy diagram uh, you will see this again later so reactants product so you see product is more stable because uh, it has a lower energy but before it forms a product it has to go to a energy barrier okay higher energy state and this it's called activation energy. All right, so that's the activate. Activation energy is the energy barrier uh, before the reactants forms product. So the higher, if you have a higher energy barrier, that means it take more energy to form product. The reaction goes slow. All right, if the uh, activation is small then mo many molecules will have enough energy uh, to overcome this barrier to form this product. So the higher the activation energy, the uh, slower the reaction rate, the rate constant. And here the temperature, all right? So how does temperature affect the reaction rate? All right, so using this equation, okay, you will, uh, so just plug in some data, you will see that the higher temperature, larger K, okay, increase temperature, increase K constant, and increase reaction rate. And this is diffi not difficult to understand because high temperature molecules becomes uh, more activated. High temperature molecule has more thermal energy and therefore they can overcome the energy barrier and forms product, so it becomes faster. Here is a uh, experiment data for a chemical reaction between ester and the water. So let's say this is A, this is B, okay? And we did four runs, okay? One, two, three, four. On all these runs, the reactants concentration are all the same. And therefore the reaction rate for all four runs does not depend a change with concentration. So only thing changes is the rate constant okay because rate rate loss as k a b in this case you have two now these two doesn't change so the only thing change is k that is affected by temperature and so let's say run one and the two the constant the temperature change from 288 to 298 so you see temperature increase 10 degree and the reaction rate almost double one times 10 to the minus 3 goes to 2 about 2 times 10 to the minus 3 so about a, a double all right so again let's see 3 and 4 you see the temperature from 308 to uh, 398 3 uh, 308 3 1, 18 the reaction rate change also about double Okay, so whenever reaction rate, uh, temperature increase uh, about 10 degree, the reaction rate uh, close to uh, double the reaction rate. And what about reaction rate constant? It also increase with temperature. So if you plot it, that's the K, that's the temperature, you see the increase, but not a linearly increase. Right? It seems like exponentially increase. And that's not a surprising because we just showed the, the uh, Arrhenius equation, the reaction rate constant 
is e to the negative ea over rt okay you see the k and the temperature uh, should be uh, exponential change in increase we already mentioned activation energy uh, so the reactants all right product uh, first needs to go through we call activated state so this is activated state and the energy between reactants and activated states is the activation energy all right so the smaller this one and then the more molecules will have enough energy to overcome this one so the larger the k constant which increase reaction rate An analogy of activation energy is a high jump. Athletes want to jump over this uh, horizontal bar, but not everyone can do, can do that. Only those with uh, high energy, uh, energetic, uh, is, can possibly uh, jump over uh, this horizontal bar. Similarly, the reactants needs to go through a activated state. And forms product so this is the uh, energy uh, activation energy and this measures the reaction rate so the smaller the faster the larger the slower now don't confuse this with this delta H delta H is between reactants and the product it measures how stable the product is so if a product has a lower energy then delta H is negative. That's exothermic reaction. All right. So this is a, a thermodynamic parameter. Tells you the stability, the equilibrium constant. Well, this one, it equal, the uh, activation energy, is uh, about the kinetics. It tells you how fast the reaction goes. A fast reaction has a slow, has a low activation energy. So how does temperature affect reaction rate? Temperature is a measure of thermal energy. Increased temperature will increase the kinetic energy of the particles. So particles move faster at a higher temperature. Okay. Now, if you have a collection of molecules, some molecules go faster, some go slow, but there's only a fraction a fraction of molecules that have enough energy to overcome activation energy and the forms product. If you increase temperature, then that fraction increase and therefore reaction rate goes faster. This is a plot of uh, the distribution of energies of a collection of molecules. Um, let's say the blue one uh, is at a T1, which let's say is uh, 300 Kelvin at this temperature. Okay, here is the fraction of molecule. If you can think about the percent of molecules. So, for example, this point, all right, the energy let's say is uh, 10 kilojoule, and uh, the percent is uh, uh, 8 percent. So you have 8 percent of molecules have 10 kilojoule energy all right and you have th let's say this is 20 kilojoule so how many molecules has 20 kilojoule well it's here and let's say this is a uh, 30 percent so 30 percent of molecules has 20 kilojoule energy and this is uh, 30 kilojoule and the 30 kilojoule has the most highest percentage let's say this is 50% uh, so 50% of molecules have 30 kilojoule and this all right this point is the most probable uh, energy so because most molecules has 30% kilojoule but you still have some percent of molecules has higher energy this is 40 and uh, this 
is let's say uh, 50 kilojoule and 50 kilojoule is the activation energy so you still have certain percent of molecules had 50 kilojoule or even higher all right and these are the percent of molecules that can overcome the activation energy and becomes the product and that happens at uh, 300 Kelvin if you increase te temperature to uh, let's say 400 that becomes this red curve okay 400 Kelvin all right and you can see here now in general the energy move up so here is the most probable uh, energy because most molecules at 400 Kelvin is here which has energy about uh, 35 kilojoule all right so you see 400 kilojoule the most probable energy is 35 compared to 300 kelvin is 25 about 25 okay so in general molecules has higher energy and also what's the percent of molecules that has energy uh, equal or greater than activation energy is right here you see that under this curve that's the percent of knowledge so this is higher than the blue ones so more molecules that has higher energy than the activation energy they can form the product so increase temperature increase percent of molecules that has uh, energy overcome the uh, activation energy becomes product this table shows the relation between activation energy temperature and the fraction of collisions that have enough energy to become the product all right so uh, at the 50 degree uh, uh, um, let's say the if activation energy is 50 kilojoule per mole at 298 kelvin the percent or fraction of molecules that have enough energy to become product is this one 10 to the minus 9 all right that's the percent that can go to the product if you increase activate activation energy then the percent of molecules becomes 10 to the negative 14 and that decrease many orders of magnitude so only small fraction can uh, can become product why because activation energy increase remember this is energy barrier so if you increase this barrier then only a small percent can overcome this barrier similarly if you increase to 100 then the activation the uh, fraction of molecules becomes 10 to the minus 18 so even much smaller uh, percent or fraction molecules can become the product now what about temperature so if you increase temperature from 20, 25 to 35 to 45 okay increase temperature and the fraction of molecules at the same activation energy the uh, the fraction of molecules increase from 1.7 to 3.2 to 6 so increase fractions why because increased temperature increase the thermal energy so the collection of molecules more all molecules increase uh, energy so the fraction of molecules uh, to overcome the activation energy also increased activation energy is an important parameter in kinetics so how do you find out activation energy uh, looking at this uh, Arrhenius equation to calculate activation energy we need to know the rate constant the temperature and uh, the frequency factor okay so if we know all this we can calculate activation energy using this Arrhenius equation now a better way to do that is to have a linear plot using this equation this equation is, is obtained by taking natural log of this Arrhenius equation so the left side becomes ln k the right side becomes ln a plus ln uh, e to the negative e a over r t and this equals uh, uh, negative e a 
over RT. So ln k equals ln a minus ea over RT, and that's this equation. Okay, we're going to talk about this more in the next slides. But first, let's ask a question: Is it possible to calculate activation energy without a? Okay, is that possible to, without a? To do that, okay, let's take um, this equation uh, twice. So ln k one, so equals ln a minus e a over r one over t one. So this means at t one the rate constant is k one. A doesn't change, activation energy doesn't change. Now if we look at another temperature, k two. Ln a minus e a r uh, divided by r times one over t two. So this is at t two equation. This is at t one. Both are Arrhenius equation at a different temperature. Now if you use uh, equation two minus one, all right, then this cancels. See, you don't have a anymore, and then that give you this equation. Okay, so any uh, student interested, please try it. You will get this uh, equation. So this is also a Arrhenius equation, but in this equation, you do not have a uh, frequency factor. You, you can calculate Ea if you know two temperature with the rate constant. Okay, if you measure two temperature, the rate constant, then you can calculate Ea without the rate uh, frequency factor. So in the last slides, we showed the Arrhenius equation where k equals e, uh, a times e to the negative e a over r t is equivalent to this equation if you take a natural log on both sides. So what's the advantage of this equation? This equation reminds you a linear equation y equals uh, b plus uh, kx. So, um, you know this is a linear equation. If you plot y and x, you should get a straight line, and the slope is k. And this is the intersection b. Okay. So if you compare these two equation, y l and k is y. So you plot l and k as y, and here this is the rate, uh, the uh, uh, slope, and this is x. All right, so you plot 1 over t, just like x here, all right, 1 over t. So plot ln k over 1 over t, you should get a straight line, all right, just like here, and the slope is k. In this case, is negative. The slope is negative Ea over r. Because it's negative, so it's instead of going up, it's going down, going like this one. The, curve, uh, the line goes down because the slope is negative, all right? And this is a better way uh, to practice in experiments because we can now measure many, many temperature with the associate k constant. So take a natural log k and uh, 1 over t, you connect all the dots, you get a straight line, and the slope is negative Ea over r. R is a gas constant, we already know, and therefore Ea can be calculated. Sample problem 16.8. This is a question about activation energy. So we have a reaction, hydrogen iodide forms hydrogen and iodine. The uh, rate constant uh, at 500 Kelvin is given, and it has a rate constant at 600 Kelvin is also given. Calculate Ea. So apparently we need a Arrhenius equation. One way uh, to write Arrhenius equation is k uh, equals a e negative Ea over rt. So in order to use this equation, you need a frequency factor. Okay, now in this question, we do not have this one. We don't have this one, but we do have two temperature, T1, K2, 
T1, T2, K2. So two temperature, two Kelvin. That reminds us another way to write Arrhenius equation. And that is ln K2 over K1 equals negative Ea over R, 1 over T2, 1 over T1. So two temperature, two Kelvin, a rate constant. And using this equation, we can solve Ea. Okay, to solve Ea, we can, uh, let's move R to this side. So division becomes multiplication, and this one, multiplication becomes division. So this also goes to the other side, to divide by it. And so that's why Ea is um, the ln K2 over K1 multiplied by R divided by uh, this inverse uh, temperature. Now, plug in all the data, okay, and calculate. Uh, you should get 1.76 times 10 to the fifth power kilojoule per mole. Okay, so I want to uh, emphasize uh, the point that when you do homework, uh, the homework it resembles uh, this uh, sample question. So if you have a homework problem 16.8, you should follow the sample problem 16.8. All right, they should be very similar. So if you really understand sample problem, you should be able to do the homework questions. In Arrhenius equation, all right, so like this, uh, you have a frequency factor. But what is a frequency factor? And uh, this equation tells you the frequency factor, okay, uh, is a product of orientation probability factor and the collision frequency. So collision frequency, of course, is one second how many collisions between molecules. All right. But what is orientation probability factor? This is related to how molecules orient when they uh, collide. Only certain orientation will lead the product. Let's look at the next. Uh, this slide shows the importance of our molecular orientation when the two reactants NO and NO3 uh, collide to form product NO2. In the left side, we show the diagram, one, two, three, four, five, five diagram, and the red one is oxygen, and the, the blue one is nitrogen. So let's look at the first uh, diagram. Okay, let's look at this one, and the left side is nitrogen, and the right side is oxygen, and on the right side you have NO3, so oxygen, nitrogen, oxygen, oxygen, okay? So when these two molecules collide along this orientation, uh, you cannot form NO2, because when you form N, NO2, the two oxygens should connect to the nitrogen. So when this collide, oxygen, oxygen cannot form a bond. So this will not uh, give you the uh, product NO2. Similarly, uh, two two, three, four, okay, all of, none of them will give you the desired the product. Now let's look at the last one. How does this uh, goes to the product? So here is nitrogen, the blue one is nitrogen, here is oxygen, and then you have uh, uh, N, uh, uh, N, O, O, Oh, so now when these two collide, you see this oxygen directly collide with this nitrogen, and they form a bond, and that gives you NO2, and this side also a NO2, and that gives you two desired product. So only the last one uh, give you effective collision along the right orientation, and so therefore this shows that uh, only a certain orientation okay, will uh, give you the desired product, product uh, after collision. Transition theory is another theory to explain kinetics. In this theory, the reactants, before they form a product, 
they first go through called the transition state or activate the complex. The transition state is an unstable species that contains partial bonds. The bonds is not final. And it is a transitional species partway between reactants and the product. The transition state exists at the point of maximum potential energy. So um, this is related to activation energy. So let's look at a diagram showing this. Okay, so in this diagram, we show the reaction between uh, bromomethane and hydroxy to form bromide and the methane. So if we draw bromine, uh, methane, let's say this is methane, and the hydroxy. So the hydroxy will go here, this bond will break, and that will give you uh, bromide plus hydrogen and OH. In other words, this will form a bond and this bond will break. Okay, But before they do that, this bond is uh, almost break and this bond is almost formed. So they form two partial bonds and that will be a transition state. And let's look at... So in this diagram, and this one is the bromine methane All right, and this is a hydroxy. Okay, so you see in this diagram, they are approaching each other. Okay, and this diagram shows that the bond, the distance between oxygen and this carbon are closer and closer. So towards this direction, they could go closer. So forms a partial bond. At the same time, this bond becomes longer, you see here. This is longer, almost a break, and this is a new bond, almost a form, all right? And that is the transition state where a old bond is about to break, a new bond is about to form. And this is not a stable species, and therefore it's high energy. So if you draw a diagram, this is a reactant, and uh, it goes to a high energy state until becomes a transition state where the new bond is about to form, old bond is about to break. And then uh, after this point, uh, this bond becomes longer and this becomes shorter and then eventually this forms a new bond. And that's the new molecule and this bond breaks. So the uh, bromine leave forms the final product. Okay, so again, the transition state is the state where the old bond start to break, the new bond is about to form, and the energy is at the maximum, all right? And in fact, this energy is the activation energy. So this diagram shows two more reactions with their possible transition state. The left side is NOCl, uh, two of them forms 2NO, with a chlorine gas. And so you see here you have uh, one molecule that's O and chlorine. And that's a, a NOCl, NOCl, right? On the right side, there's another NOCl. So when two uh, molecules NOCl approach each other, and the chlorine and the chlorine uh, start to uh, form a bond and uh, NO, this bond will break, this bond will break, and that will give you chlorine gas. So these two will form chlorine gas, and this will go to form NO. Similarly, this will form NO. But before they form the final product, right, this bond is about to form the real bond, and this bond is about to break, and that is the transition state. That's the highest energy. So the highest energy when two molecules approach each other, the new bond is about to, to form and the two old bonds is about to break. And that's very high energy transition state. Now, similarly, here you have NO and oxygen, O3 ozone 
forms NO2 and oxygen gas. So left side is NO, right side is O3. All right. To form the product, this oxygen has to go here to form a bond. This bond will break. All right. But before they form this product, this new bond is about to form, and this old bond is about to break. And that is this transition state that has the highest energy. Sample problem 16.9. This is about uh, energy diagram and the transition state. And this is about reaction between ozone molecule and oxygen to form oxygen gas. Okay, and um, the activation energy for the forward reaction is 19 kilojoule delta H the enthalpy is negative 392 so in general the uh, the uh, energy diagram you have reactants you have product uh, through a transition state it looks like this one so um, you should know that between reactants the product that's the delta H and between the reactants and the transition state, that's the uh, activation energy. So it says activation energy is 19, and this delta H is uh, negative 392. So first thing is, why is negative? Negative is because uh, product is, has a lower energy than the reactants. Now, if the product uh, if the de uh, delta H is positive, then you would expect the reactant's product is here. So the reactant's product is here, all right? Then this delta H will be positive. Now here, the question is negative, so you will see react product should be below reactants. Now also, when you draw the energy diagram, the uh, because uh, delta H 392 is much much greater than, than 19 so you should show the activation energy is small and the product has very low so just show this delta H is much greater than activation energy so that's a drawing we'll see in the next slides they also ask you to predict the structure of transition state and so let's look at the molecule you have O3 so O3, so three oxygens, okay? And three oxygen, you have a, a oxygen um, atom, and when they should form two uh, oxygen gas. That means this bond will break, this bond will form, all right? So this bond uh, forms a new bond. And the transition state should be uh, when this bond is about to form and this bond is about to break so you have double bond here so this bond is about to break you should use dot line dot line to show that's a transition state okay so let's look at the next slides All right and this is the drawing and you can see trans the ch activation energy is small the delta h is large all right negative 392 negative shows product has a lower energy than the reactants okay you can also calculate the energy between product and the transition state that's the uh, uh, 411 okay the transition state here shows this is the uh, ozone and this is oxygen and using dot line to show this is a partial uh, bond that is about to form that's a new bond and this is the old bond that is about to break. So they use a dot line all right, to show it's a partial bond. And that's the transition state right at the top of the energy diagram. So far, we have discussed simple reactions. It could be first order reaction, second order reaction, zero order reaction. But in many cases, a reaction can be very complicated. It can be a collection of many steps. For example, uh, A goes to uh, D, for example. This is a overall reaction that you can measure. But at a molecular level, it can actually include many steps. So 
A may first form a B, and then B may form a C, and then C forms D, for example. Very simple, right? So when they combine together, eventually you, you only see A goes to D. But in the, at the molecular level, it, it have many steps. And this is called reaction mechanism. So the reaction mechanism is the sequence of single reaction steps. Now at the uh, molecular, so because the mechanism, the steps are at the molecular level, so it's called elementary steps. These elementary steps, right, right, and you can uh, you can deduce the rate law, all right. You cannot say rate law from this reaction. This is overall reaction. You cannot say this is the first order, second order. But if you look at the mechanism, each step you can. Uh, right mechanism just by looking how many molecules participate in the reaction. Okay, we're going to see in the next slide, slides. This is called molecularity. So molecularity means how many reactants combine to form this product. Okay, so at the molecular level or elementary steps, if you have one molecule at the reactants, then this is called the unimolecular reaction. And the reaction rate is the first order because only one molecule. So here is one, okay, first order reaction. And if the reactant uh, includes two molecules, then it's called a biomolecular, bimolecular uh, reaction. And uh, the rate law is second order reaction. This is another bimolecular reaction. You have two molecules A and B here you have A plus A, that's a bimolecular. A plus B, also bimolecular. So KAB, that's a second order reaction, okay? And here you have three molecules, 2A plus B, that's three molecules. So that's a term molecular, and the reaction is a third order reaction, KA squared B, okay? So you can see, if you have a uh, overall reaction, okay? The rate law, you don't know yet. But if you know in the mechanism, and then if it's one molecule, that's a unimolecular reaction. Two molecule, then that's a bimolecular. You can immediately write the rate law. Okay? Then you can combine the rate law from the elementary steps. And then you can deduce the rate law for the overall reaction. Now here is a sample problem, 16.10. In this question, you have a mechanism, all right? Remember, mechanism is those elementary steps that happens at a molecular level. And therefore, at looking at the reactants, you can find out the molecularity, whether it's a unimolecular reaction, it's a bimolecular reaction, and then you can write the rate law for each of those elementary steps. But the first question is, what is the overall reaction? Okay, and so, so again, this is the mechanism with three elementary steps. And to write the balanced equation of the overall reaction, we uh, look at the each steps, if you have uh, a, uh, in the uh, is, uh, substance that is a reactance in one reaction but the product of the other, then you can cancel them. And in fact, you have two chlorine as a reactants, but here you have two as a product. So then they cancel each other. All right. Similarly, uh, here you have CCl3 as a reactants in the third uh, step but CCl3 as a product on the second step. So you cancel this one, all right? And then the left, what's left is chlorine as the reactants. Here, CCH, Cl3 as a reactants. These are the two only reactants that uh, is uh, left. Forms product, which is HCl, plus CCl4. And this is the overall reaction, okay? All right, so that's how you find the overall reaction. You cancel those 
uh, substance that serves as reactants in one step, products as the other. All right, and then what's left is the overall reaction. Okay, next, determine the molecularity of each step. So look at the first uh, step. Uh, the reactants only have one molecule, so that's a unimolecular reaction. And look at the second step. You have A, you have B, so that's a, a, a bimolecular reaction. Similarly, this is a bimolecular reaction. All right, so unimolecular for the first one, bimolecular for the second and the third one. And then you can write the rate law, because if it's a unimolecular, then that's the first order reaction. So this will be just a rate constant. If this is a K, rate constant is K1, this rate constant is K2, this rate constant is K3, then the first reaction rate law is K1 times chlorine to the first power. And the second one is K2 times chlorine times CHCl3. Yeah, that's the second order reaction. Similarly, this one will be K3 times chlorine times CCl3. Okay, so that's how you write rate law right, for elementary steps. We all have the experience that when you drive uh, through the highway and somewhere there may be a construction, so this becomes slow, okay? And then you go fast again. So how much time to take to go home? It depends on the slow step. If you can improve this construction place, then you you can go home very fast. So um, slow step actually determines the time. Similarly here, the slowest step in a reaction is the rate determining uh, or rate limiting step. All right. So in a chemical reaction, the slowest step, slowest step determines the overall reaction rate. Okay. For example, this is an overall reaction. Reactants NO2, CO forms NO, CO2. In, at the molecular level, um, you have two steps. NO2, NO2 forms NO3, NO, and then NO3, CO forms NO2, CO2. And if you look at uh, the product NO3, here also used as a reactant, so you cancel each other and combine together, you will get this overall reaction. So these two combined together is the overall reaction. But this is the elementary steps. Okay? It turns out that this step is a very slow step. Okay? This is a slow step. And therefore, according to our theory, the slowest step determines the reaction rate. So the reaction rate for this one is should be determined by this slow step. And because it's elementary step, so we can write a rate law looking at the molecularity. You have two molecules, and the reaction is second order. Should be K times NO2 times NO2, because you have NO2, NO2. In other words, it's NO2 squared. It, so doing experiment is find out that the observed rate law is actually K times NO2 to the second power. That's consistent right, with the theory. So proposed mechanism uh, rate law okay, is consistent with the experiments. So the rate law for the rate determining step becomes the rate law for the overall reaction. So how do scientists know the reaction mechanism? Reaction me mechanism is a collection of elementary steps that are supposed to happen at the molecular level, and the people cannot see it. So how do we know? Chemists use their knowledge and uh, experimental data and then propose the mechanism. But the mechanism must meet three criteria. That is, elementary step must add to the overall balance equation. You have seen uh, one example. The elementary steps must be reasonable, and the mechanism must correlate with observed rate law you see in the last slides. A mechanism is a hypothesis. We cannot prove it is correct, 
but it is if, if it is consistent with the experiments then you can use it to predict the results accurately and it is a useful model for the reaction let's look at the example so 2NO2 plus F2 forms 2NO2F um, this reaction is an overall reaction so you cannot write a rate law just saying this is a second order because you have two uh, molecules A and the first order with the fluorine you have one you cannot say that because it's not elementary steps only elementary step in the mechanism you can write rate law uh, due to the mo molecularity so how do you do that okay we propose here the following mechanism and the first step is uh, NO2 uh, fluorine forms NO2F plus F atom fluorine atom and then second step is another NO2 plus fluorine atom forms NO2 uh, fluoride okay so if you add these two together all right so this is uh, let's see this atom is the product in the first step and this is the reactants in the second step so you cancel this one and now you add this together you have 2NO2 plus fluorine forms 2N2NO2F uh, and that's exactly the overall reaction right so the elementary steps add sum up to the overall uh, balanced equation therefore this is a good uh, thing sign that the mechanism is uh, probably right okay now let's look at the uh, rate law in the first step okay you have two molecules all right and therefore this is a bimolecular reaction and that's a second order reaction okay so therefore you can write as k1 no2 fluorine you can do that because this is elementary step in a mechanism and you can write rate law based on molecularity you cannot do that for the overall reaction but you can do this here so second step you have NO2 fluorine and so you can write a rate law like this all right what is the overall reaction rate law all right in the mechanism we propose the first step is a slow step the second step is a fast and this, therefore the first step is the rate determining step because that's the slow step is the rate determining step and therefore the overall reaction rate should be determined by and this step that's so this determines the overall reaction rate law and that is exactly observed in the experiment experimental show reaction rate overall reaction is first order with NO2 first order with fluorine all right and that is consistent with the proposed mechanism and therefore mechanism is therefore reasonable in the last slides we showed an example where the first step is a slow step and the rate determining so we can write a rate law and we can derive the overall rate law here we are going to show you a different mechanism where the second step is a slow step but the first step is fast and reversible how do we use this information to derive rate law okay so first let's add these two elementary step together uh, to see if we can get the overall reaction rate the uh, equa equation and we find that NO3 is the product in the first step but reactant in the second step so you cancel this one and when you add it together all right when you add these two together uh, you get 2NO oxygen forms 2NO2 that's the overall reaction and therefore we have the balanced overall reaction equation okay now let's look at uh, rate law for the first step you have a reactants NO oxygen so it's a bimolecular reaction and the rate law is a second order okay so you write a second order reaction the rate constant is a k1 k1 now it says reversible so what does reversible mean it means the product also go back so this also go back 
and it has a grid constant k minus one. Okay, k minus one is a, just a symbol of rate constant for the reverse reaction. And for the reverse reaction, NO3 is the reactant. It will go back from NO3. So this is the reactant. You only have one molecule, and therefore it's a unimolecular reaction. It's a first order reaction. So the reaction rate is, uh, is uh, K minus one times NO3. NO3 is the reactant, okay? So that's the reverse reaction rate, uh, rate law. The second step here has uh, NO3 and NO, so it's a bimolecular reaction, second order reaction. So you write the rate law. Because the second step is slow, and therefore it's rate determined, so you should use this reaction rate law to represent the overall reaction. So this is overall reaction rate. But that's not the end, because in this rate law, you have NO, which is the reactant. But what is NO3? NO3 is not the, any of the reactants. It's not the product. So it's not a reactant. It's not the product. It's an intermediate. Intermediate only appear in the mechanism. So here, for the first step, NO3 is the product. But the second step is the reactants. Intermediate is something that appears in the mechanism but does not appear in the uh, overall reaction. Okay, So that's not good for the rate law. Because in a rate law, we should be able to calculate reaction rate. If it's a reactant's product, we can measure the concentration. But if it's intermediate, then that's something very reactive. All right, we cannot measure it. And so, in general, if a mechan if a rate law involves an intermediate, then you have to replace it by either reactants or product. Okay, so how do we do that? We use the information here that the first step is fast and reversible. If if it's reversible and also fast, then that means it can reach equilibrium. So if the reaction reach equilibrium, that means the first first step and the uh, reverse reaction forward reverse becomes equal. Okay, and so you let uh, this equal, okay, this forward reaction rate law, reverse rate law equal. And based on this, you can solve the concentration of the intermediate, okay? Because in the rate law, you have NO3, all right? You don't want it. And using equilibrium, uh, you can calculate NO3, okay? So the NO3 is K1 divided by K minus one, uh, NO oxygen, both are reactants. And then you plug into this uh, rate law for the second step, you get the overall reaction rate law. And in this equation, you see here, you have two NO, that's give you NO, uh, NO to the second power. You have one oxygen, and you also have several constant. So you have K1, K minus one, that's the ratio of the forward divided by reverse. Both are constant. And the K2 is also constant, so you can combine all together into the overall rate constant. And that's the overall rate law. Compare with the experiment. This is the experiment. All right. You see the, the rate, con uh, rate law uh, based on the mechanism is consistent uh, with the exper experiment determined rate law. So in summary, we derived rate law, which contains all constant combined together, give you a constant, and combine NO2 give you the second order reaction. All this is consistent with the observed rate law. And for any mechanism, only reactants in involved appear in the overall reaction rate law, not the intermediate. If you have intermediate, for example, at the beginning, you have the second step, rate determining step, but you, that's not the end because it involves intermediate. You need to solve it. So how do you solve it? You assume because the first step is fast and reversible. So you can assume it's, it reaches equilibrium and using equilibrium, you can calculate intermediate concentration and then plug in uh, to calculate 
the uh, overall rate law. Sample problem 1611. Uh, a mechanism is proposed that contains three steps. Identify the intermediate and assume the second step is slow. All right. Show the mechanism is consistent with observed rate law, this rate law. Okay, so we are going to derive rate law and see if it's consistent with this one. Again, this shows the mechanism, three steps, and we notice that chlorine atom is the product in the first step, but reactants in the second and third step. All right, and uh, CCl3 is a product in the second step, but it is a uh, reactant in the third step. So when we add all three steps together to get the overall reaction, they cancel each other. Okay. In other words, Cl, okay, this thing does not appear in the overall reaction. And CCl3 uh, also only appear in the, uh, in the intermediate, uh, sorry, in the um, mechanism, but not in the overall reaction. And this kind of uh, substance is called intermediate. Okay, so chlorine and um, uh, CCl3 are both intermediates uh, in the reaction. Let's derive the rate law. And the second step is a slow step. That means this is the rate determining step, and the overall rate law uh, can uh, is determined by this step. Okay, so we write the rate law, and because this step, uh, the reactants has two molecules, so it's a bimolecular reaction. The react rate law is a second order reaction. K2 is rate constant, chlorine and uh, CHCl3. Now, is this the end? Is this the answer? Uh, no. The reason is the rate law involves product or reactants but also has an intermediate. Intermediate cannot appear in the rate law. You need to replace this by reactants. How do we do that? Notice that the second step is slow. That means the first step is fast. Also note that this is reversible. And therefore we can assume fast reversible reaches equilibrium. And when the reaction reaches equilibrium, the forward rate constant equals reverse rate constant. So forward Cl2 is the reactants. It's a one molecule, so unimolecular, first order reaction, K1 Cl2. Now the reverse reaction, you have two Cl, so two molecules, bimolecular reaction, second order. So you have second order. This is the reactants. K chlorine is the reactants. K minus one, that's the reverse rate constant. So when the reaction reach uh, equilibrium, the forward rate reaction rate equals reverse reaction rate. Okay, using this equation, we can solve this chlorine atom concentration by the left side divided by k minus one and then square root of it. Okay, so that's the chlorine concentration. That's the intermediate. Plug in this rate law. All right and you get this equation. This is the overall reaction rate. Note that these are all constant, K2, K1, K-1. You can replace by rate constant K. So here shows that the reaction overall rate law is first order with uh, CHCl3, half order with chlorine, and that is consistent with the observed rate law here. Okay. So we have seen the energy diagram for a one-step reaction. So you have reactants and you have product go through a transition state. Okay, so that's the transition state. And this is the activation energy. And this is delta H. 
okay so in this case delta h is negative because product is more stable so it's exothermic reaction now if it's endothermic you should see something like this one so this is a per reactants this is a product this is a transition state again activation energy is here but the delta h is uh, positive all right so that's a endothermic reaction in any case you see one transition state okay one transition state uh, activation energy now if you have two steps for example a goes to b and then b goes to c then in the energy diagram you should see two transition state so this is the transition say let's say this is a reactance and this forms b through a first transition state and then b go through another transition state forms c so two transition state and and the first one here is the activation energy for the first step okay and uh, so this is the ea1 and this one all right you have another transition state so this is activation energy uh, for step two notice for this diagram left side the second step uh, transitions the activation energy is much smaller uh, than than the activation energy for the first step so smaller activation energy faster reaction so the second step is fast the first step is slow okay so this energy diagram shows the first step is a slow step all right because ea here is much larger than this uh, ea2 all right now let's look at the right side you also have two transition state so a again goes to b here and then b goes to c here all right through two transition state and activation energy for the first one is here for the second one is this one so you see the second transition activation energy ea2 is much greater than ea1 a larger transition state of activation energy means slow step so the second step is a slow this is a slow step and the first step is fast many of you may already heard of uh, the word catalyst in chemistry a catalyst is a substance that can increase reaction rate without being consumed in the reaction in general a catalyst provides alternative reaction pathway that has a lower activation energy okay and the catalyst will speed up both the forward and reverse reaction a catalyst does not affect the delta h let's look at the energy diagram so in this energy diagram the red one is uncatalyzed reaction so you have reactants product through a transition state this is activation energy because activation energy is high so the reaction goes slow now if you add a catalyst the reaction instead of go directly through the transition state to the product it go a different path so for example in this case it go uh, from a b goes to a intermediate and so you see you have two transition state that means it goes through two steps through a transition state one to an intermediate and then go to a transition state two and then forms the product the important thing to see here is both of the two steps the activation energy so this is activation energy for step one and this is activation energy for step two both activation energy is much much smaller than this uncatalyzed uh, ac activation energy the smaller activation energy means the faster reaction so both steps are much faster than uncatalyzed reaction so in general a catalyst uh, provide a, a different path to form product and on the path the activation energy is much reduced 
and because the activation energy is smaller, the reaction go faster. A typical catalytic reaction is hydrogen peroxide decomposed into oxygen gas and water. Now, hydrogen peroxide decompose reaction is a very slow reaction, so you shouldn't see much change. However, if you add a small amount of sodium bromide into the solution, so this is a solid, all right, you add the sodium bromide, you immediately see the bubbles coming out. You see a lot of bubbles. That's because of the oxygen gas uh, evolved. And also at the same time, the bromide becomes bromine, turns the color orange. And the bromine eventually uh, will go back to uh, bromide. And in other words, this is a catalyst that during the reaction, it make reaction go faster, but in the end, it will regenerate. So that's the catalyst, make reaction go fast, but it's not consumed in the overall reaction because it can be regenerated in the process. In the last slide, we show the catalytic reaction and that is an example of a homogeneous reaction where the catalyst and the reactants are all in the same phase. Here we show a heterogeneous catalyst and the catalyst is a solid and the reactants is a gas phase. They are in different phases. So the reaction is between hydrogen gas and the alkenes, for example, CH2, the double bond CH2 forms CH3. CH3. So the two hydrogen goes to the double bond. And if this reaction is catalyzed by a platinum metal, so here shows the metal uh, surface. So you have you see many, many metal um, atoms. And first step is hydrogen gas adsorb. Adsorb onto the catalyst surface. The, this is the hydrogen gas. And then the double bond alkene also adsorb onto the surface. All right, so when they both adsorb onto the surface, the hydrogen molecule uh, bond break forms uh, atoms, hydrogen atom, and the double bond also attached to the, double, uh, to the surface and the pi bond break, and then the uh, atoms move add to uh, the, the alkene, and then forms the product, a saturated product, this one, and then this option, leave. All right, leave the surface. And that's the typical steps in, in a heterogeneous catal catalytic reactions. First absorb onto the surface, and then react, and then this option. One important catalyst is enzyme. Um, we know that in our body, there are many chemical reactions take place at any instant. Most of chemical reaction requires enzyme as a catalyst. Here shows a lock and the key model in which the first step is the reactants, which we call substrate, combined with the enzyme molecule, all right, forms enzyme substrate complex. This is similar to the situation in the last uh, uh, slides where hydrogen adsorb ad onto the surface and the alkene adsorb onto the surface together and then forms a product. So here they combine to form a enzyme substrate complex and then interact with each other and forms product and leave the enzyme. And uh, in this process, the reaction becomes fast due to the enzyme interaction. Now, important feature uh, for enzyme catalysis is that each enzyme has a specific shape, and this shape uh, match the particular reactants very well. And therefore, the active site of enzyme is specific to the substrate. All right, so particular enzyme only catalyze a, a certain 
reactants because they match the shape very well.